is Gordon Ong and Brad Charkets. We are bringing you a special Full Nerd episode from CES. And if you didn't know, AMD is back. We are here at AMD's booth where they've got Vega, they've got Ryzen, and we have a super special guest. Radeon Technologies Group head honcho and the smartest guy in the room, <laughs> Roger Kadori. So we are going to ask questions that we want to ask about Vega, and then we are also encouraging you to please ask your questions. And I'm going to say it up front, because he can't tell you how much. He can't tell you when it's coming out. He can't tell you the clock speeds. And if your username is Jensen, he's not telling you anything. <laughs> but please ask anyway, because we want you to ask as many questions as you can. Brad knows a lot more about GPUs for me, and he actually has a lot more Vega questions. And I'm hungover, so I'm going <laughs> to let him ask the first question of Roger. Uh, hey, how's it going, Roger? Uh, so, you announced a bunch of new uh, technical preview for Radeon Vega, right? And one of the big things is the high bandwidth cache and the high bandwidth cache controller. And, you know, it's improved speed, right? Improved speed, improves, it uh, makes a very large amount of uh, memory available to the graphics card, right? Mm -hmm. So that obviously has a lot of benefits for enterprise space, business space. Uh, what sort of benefits can gamers get out of that? Yep, absolutely. Uh, first off, both Gordon Brand, you know, thanks for uh, you know, <laughs> being here. And I, as always, whether it's on camera, off camera, mm -hmm. I would love you know nerding out <laughs> about GPUs with you guys. So on high bandwidth cache, right? So from a gaming perspective, right? Um, we looked at like you know all the modern games, the, the big games that push like memory hard. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we noticed is that the you know we call it utilization, right? You know, video RAM, VRAM utilization. We look at kind of you know how much of the VRAM that the game allocates, right? Mm -hmm. So if the game say needs four gigabytes of textures mm -hmm. or you know memory, mm -hmm. when we looked at actually what how much of that memory is actually used to render pixels, we found that many actually most games don't use more than fifty percent of what they allocate. Yeah, you're saying that's okay. the, even with Witcher and stuff. Yeah, like even that. with uh, big, big it's, name stuff. Yeah, 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 and they are optimized games, and mm -hmm. and that's because the the current the old GPU architecture doesn't give you flexibility to move memory in a fine granularity. Mm -hmm. So with Vega and with the high bandwidth cache and high bandwidth cache controller for games, it'll mm -hmm. utilize the amount of uh, frame buffer you have mm -hmm. much more efficiently. So effectively you can think of as Vega will be doubling your memory capacity for games in there. So, right? so. so basically like a game that says it uses four gigabytes of RAM right now yeah. is in actuality using two or yes. so, for right, example. Right, and you're right. saying with Vega it'll actually allocate two. Exactly. Is right. that something that uh, developers are going to have to plan around, or is that something that you guys no, handle? No, so 100%? when developers take advantage of that, of course, they can throw in more high resolution assets and all, right? One of the discussions, you know, uh, Gordon and me were having at dinner is that, uh, you know, we run games at 4K, right? Because we can just crank up the resolution and all. But today, a lot of assets, like the textures and the geomet the models and all of that stuff, they're not created for 4K, they're created for 1080p. Mm -hmm. So you're not getting full benefit of 4K because the developer, it's a lot more expensive for those assets. And they don't do that because it costs lots of memory, it doesn't fit their minimum spec machine and all of those things, right? So Vega will encourage developers to, because they, they have high resolution uh, assets, mm -hmm. Use ship them. them, right? <laughs> Use them, ship them, and uh, and and so it makes 4K gaming kind of, you know, I think we we are entering the 4K gaming era, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know it'll take a few years for to get a real high quality 4K okay. game. Okay, so I got it though. I got asked though. So if it sort of gives you more effective memory mm -hmm. use use of the memory, your frame buffer, does that mean future video cards won't need as much frame buffer? Like right now. You know, marketing, it's very great to market cards like, hey, we've got an eight gig, six mm -hmm. gig frame buffer. Yeah. In the future, is it possible people only have three gig or four gig? So or? what the high bandwidth cache and the cache controller does actually, it actually changes the entire conversation around what is your memory, right? And what is your kind of, you know, how, how much high bandwidth cache do you have? Mm -hmm. And how much speed do you have, right? So one of the things you notice is that uh, even in the current video card reviews, there are many four gigabyte cards that beat the crap out of eight gigabyte cards, okay? <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, unfortunately we haven't, uh, you know, set up the industry right about what is important, right? Nobody actually understands how much bandwidth their card has, mm -hmm. right? So, 
you know, bandwidth is many times much more important than how much footprint do you sure. have, right? So, uh, I think uh, one of the things, what you'll see us doing, and again, you know, the Vega architecture preview was just a very high level one, but in the coming months, we will be changing the entire conversation around how to look at memory, how much memory you got, how much cache you got, mm -hmm. how much bandwidth you got. And in fact, we want to educate to the gamers the importance of bandwidth. In fact, we, you know, we want to put front and center on the box, mm -hmm. okay, how much bandwidth you have, <laughs> which we don't. Right now, you, right. you know, even it's, the it's most... It's quantity, it's your the, capacity. Yeah, most, you know, only the kind of the nerdiest of the nerds know. They mm -hmm. can tell, oh, I have 384 gigabytes per second, right? But, right. you know, we want to make that much more kind of very clearly visible because that's really important for performance mm -hmm. than exact amount of footprint that you have. And with Vega, because we are expanding the footprint because the addressable memory is literally terabytes. Uh, by the way, that the other thing that it opens up for games is a completely different form of rendering that they could do when, mm -hmm. when you have that you know, sparse access of like terabytes of memory, right? Mm -hmm. There are very many interesting uh, r rendering approaches that you know, people were looking at even 10 years ago, 15 years ago, Carmack and all, that they didn't uh, with the way GPU managed memory. Now all of those stuff will come back and say, hmm, maybe I can do this entire thing way differently if I have ability to do sparse accesses to textures much more efficiently, right? So I mean, it, I mean, I guess in the future we'll see. Hey, it's you'll see high bandwidth cache, a label on the box. It's really hard to re-educate consumers to exactly. go like, yeah. you know, I I want this card with 12 yeah. gigs of frame buffer. I, yeah. I'm not going to take one with six. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. It's it's hard, and and, and we are. Uh, <laughs> That's why you he's know. here to tell you. <laughs> one, yeah, one. it's very very hard. You know, changing nomenclature. You know, uh, actually, you know, memory. In fact, not just graphics, right? Changing memory hierarchy. Uh, changing memory types for computer industry has always been a difficult problem. Remember the transition when we went from uh, uh, hard disk to SSD? How hard it was initially because you know SSDs had smaller uh, sizes and they were expensive and all. Right. That was hard, right? right? You know, it took so many years to kind of you know now. Some people still haven't bought into it. Right in mm -hmm. there, right? And they do hybrids and other stuff in there, right? And I mean that's an extreme example of memory hierarchy. This uh, so the one of the reasons why. We took the approach with the high bandwidth cache controller is that we, all the lessons learned from the previous memory transitions, so we, you can make all of this stuff work only if you make it transparent to the user, where user doesn't have to make this tough choice of, hey, do I buy a 128 gig SSD that boots fast and all, or a, you know, a two terabyte hard disk that is cheaper, right? So I want to take that, uh, you know, Sophie's, Sophie's choice out of the user stuff. It's like. Don't worry. <laughs> you just don't have to worry, right? <laughs> you know, just, you know, if you have, you know, look at how much bandwidth you're buying mm -hmm. and how much cash uh, you have in there, right? And everything else takes care of itself, right? Don't worry, right? That's kind of where we need to get to. Mm -hmm. Of course, we need the whole ecosystem to come together uh, before it happens. So, we, so we, we don't have any rose-colored glasses that it's like kind of, you know, on day one we are able to educate sure. people and all. They will want to know kind of, you know, the, the old terminology will take a little bit, uh, you know, to, uh, to move but, out. But Vega is the beginning of the architecture and we have to bring that concept down to up and down the stack as mm -hmm. well, right, for yeah. to change the terminology. So, you know, and, and, and we have a multi-year plan to do that. But on day one, will uh, games that already exist be able, to, will they consume less memory, as you're saying, because they're acting more efficiently? Because yeah, I mean, Vegas no, doing I, so basically for them, they don't see it, you know, they're just allocating the memory to the APIs like they are. Uh -huh. They get all the allocations, uh, the, you know, they don't, they won't see a difference. Mm -hmm. For example, right, if you, uh, today's game say, you know, because they say it's built for four gigabyte, and yep. say you have a four gigabyte card, it all plays well, but, you know, when you swap in, for example, you know, when you all tab out of uh, a game, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, go into a browser or something to do something quick, and when you come back, it takes a long time, right? Yeah. Because the whole thing was swapped out and swapped yeah. in. So with Vega, you'll see those stuff be much more efficient because uh, yeah, the, the, it didn't really, like I said, it wasn't using all four gigabytes. It was only using a portion of it. So we didn't actually load that up all inside your mm -hmm. uh, you know, precious cache. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, know, you can pull in the Windows stuff and all more efficiently and all. So you'll see those kind of benefits. Mm -hmm. But let's say you have a game that wants to push eight gigabytes, mm -hmm. right, when you turn high detail on and all of that mm -hmm. stuff, it will run much more efficiently in a four gigabyte configuration, right? Okay. Yeah, right, so you'll see, you'll start seeing those kind of benefits. Okay, right. uh, so I got a question. We talked a little bit about this yesterday and, that, and you just mentioned earlier that most games, you know, as an enthusiast, I like to run everything, max resolution, 
you know, ultra, everything, yeah. ultra, yeah. ultra, ultra, ultra. But you're saying you really, it just doesn't, you're saying the difference between ultra and the normal setting just isn't that big of a deal. And, and yeah, you know, the, the, this is kind of the interesting thing. I kind of, you know, myself kind of personally realized just recently, right, that the, uh, some of the games, those ultra settings, right, it's, so the game is developed for a default setting, right? The whole experience is developed around a default setting. And that's where your artwork is created for to look good in that mm -hmm. settings in there, right? Uh, and it's very expensive to create artwork, by the way. The most expensive thing is to create artwork. And the higher resolution the artwork is, the more expensive to create, okay? So these slider bars to the right, the games are not, you know, the artwork wasn't created to that stuff. What they do is just, you know, scale up uh, existing textures and all of that stuff. So they don't look that much better, really. But it makes us feel good as if, you know, sure. uh, uh, we're running side detail and all, right? I, admit, yeah. I feel great when I run everything and alter it at 70 <laughs> frames a second. So. Uh, right, right. So I think um, there is something to be said in terms of, like, you know, in terms of actual game experience, right? I mean, the, we all are kind of, you know, geeks and nerds. We like benchmarking in various mm -hmm. ways, I understand that. But for a broader gaming audience in there, take a look at, you know, if games have really spent time, you know, creating the ultra mode for you. Mm -hmm. The developer invested, it's worth for you to run. If not, you're just wasting wasting cycles, wasting, you throwing know. Throwing away performance. You're throwing away performance. <laughs> throwing away yeah. money. Yeah, I mean, you're throwing you're away money. for. Exactly, <laughs> you know, and, and don't do that. Really, yeah. that really it's very, very expensive. These games are, you know, cost $200 million to develop, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, uh, uh, it, it's like, you know, doing a true 4K game is, uh, is, is going to be very expensive. Is there anything, because I'm, as an enthusiast, I do want those ultra, ultra textures. What, what will it take to get developers to, to for most of them to do that, because I know most of them don't, yeah. but I know a few do. What yeah, yeah, a few do, and, and, and I think, you know, what you'll see, because, you know, with, with uh, high resolution displays and high DPI displays, um, you know, things like, you know, one of the things that's very, very obvious that attracts all of us is that the heads-up display that you have in the game, right, the mm -hmm. text and the other stuff looks very sharp on, mm -hmm. a, on, a, on a 4K display, right? Yep. Because anything that has high frequency edges like text looks immediately beautiful. But the natural things that are in a game, your trees, your this stuff and other things, you actually have to look hard to say like, you know, uh, is it really better or not? And if you do, you have to almost do a side by side sure. to kind of see, see, see the things in there. So uh, what I think um, uh, will happen is that the, that the obvious kind of high, high frequency stuff developers will start putting assets for those. And we are seeing that already, right, in there, that the, you know, they're redesigning the UIs and all to give the benefits. But for the entire world to kind of you know, become high resolution, I think, again, like I said, when 4K panels become more um, pervasive, they'll feel like that the investment is worth. And I think the good news is, like, you know, this year, we're starting to see the prices of the 4K panels kind of get, come, get yeah. there, right? So, yeah. I'd say, like, you know, by, you know, Christmas 2017 will be interesting, but, you know, I think, that's why I said we, ent we are really entering the 4K gaming era now. Mm -hmm. And if you look at how long, you know, we kept saying 1080p is here and all, but, like, to have smooth 1080p play gaming across the board took a while. Yeah, yeah. Right? And, and I think that's what we'll see with the, with the stuff. And, and our goal, at least my personal goal in 2017, is to kind of bring that 4K fluidity to the market, at least at some segments in there, but kind of really drive that to be, you know, pervasive. And then the developers will start kind of in taking it much more seriously. And so, that actually, oh, go ahead. I don't want to say, yeah. I don't want to. I was going to crack a lame joke. You can go ahead. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> So people joke. always make the joke that, you know, their New Year's resolution is 4K. <laughs> it sounds like yours literally is. <laughs> <laughs> what, yeah, so this brings up another thing. You, you're saying you were, you've been toying with getting a PC that a PC that somebody can build for a thousand dollars that will play 4K games this year, right? That's that's my you know that's kind of my uh, like you know kind of new New Year stretch <laughs> resolution, right? And, and and it's the whole PC in there, right? And and you know, funny enough, and I actually uh, was looking at uh, the articles you guys did uh, right before Christmas on uh, the PC gaming PC builds that you did, right? You know, the budget PC and the performance PC, they were wonderful. Uh, articles. So I was looking at it and going, it's basically, you know, to feed a 4K game, how much CPU do I need, right? Mm -hmm. How much GPU do I need? And of course, you need a decent sized, uh, you know, SSD and hard drive, right? Mm -hmm. And some uh, decent sized memory. But 
you know, when they're all put together today, they're coming up to $2,000 and it still won't actually quite play 4K, right? Yep. So, I have a 2X challenge, <laughs> right? So, so, compression of the dollars by, by 2X and, uh, and, and I'm looking at it, not just uh, us. You know, we have Ryzen, you know, Ryzen coming, it's, which is awesome for, uh, you know, feeding a kind of a 4K GPU, but uh, we are also working with all our partners and all and having this discussion. They all like that idea, right? It's mm -hmm. like, you know, a sub thousand dollar kind of, you know, a 4K, 4K stuff. Is That's the dream, right? Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> like, you know, so it's very concrete user benefit. So how can we make it happen, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm, 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 it's definitely my goal to kind of, you know, see, uh, see that happen, but I, but, you know, it's not all in my control. I have to have sure. the some of the components, other components. Uh, Takes a family. Come in there, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, I think yeah. we have a question from the audience. Yes, yes. Some questions about the overclocking potential for the Vega card. What can you tell us about that? Uh, so we, uh, so, so Tyler, our producer, just said somebody on Facebook asked. We're going to ask Raja. What are the overclocking potentials of Vega? He probably can't answer this. Let's see yes. what we can get. Roger to tell us. <laughs> I, I think you should uh, ask us in, uh, when in it a comes little bit. No, but yeah, it, it's like we are figuring that out ourselves right now, right? So it's in engineering uh, labs and all, and you know we're doing a lot of work figuring that out. So you know we'll we'll know we'll know more uh, you know in the coming you, weeks. You so. can't talk exactly about it, but Vega was built using the same Infinity fabric that Ryzen's based around, right? Yes. Yes. And so they've already talked a little bit about their overclocking capabilities, right? Yes. Will any of that knowledge translate over into Vega? Uh, it's definitely, we use the, you know, we share the same uh, power management logic and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, various things. But also remember that the CPU design it's and the different. GPU design, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. are, are right. fundamentally different. Yes. Right. Although, like, can we, for yeah. those of us that don't know what Infinity Fabric is, could you, I mean, it sounds like some awesome clothing, clothing line. <laughs> <laughs> so what is Infinity yeah. Fabric for the audience? Yeah, so Infinity Fabric, just putting it in kind of simple terms, right, it is the way we connect all of our different uh, function blocks, like IPs we call them, like, you know, how graphics, multimedia, display, uh, all of this, connect with each other and connect with the memory subsystem, which is very, very important, right? So this is a new fabric that we developed, a new way to connect all of these things that let us use the, the same infrastructure for CPUs, GPUs, and APUs, mm -hmm. right? And all, the way up to, and all the way up to kind of server to mobile stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So the, this helps us do uh, chips uh, much, much faster mm -hmm. uh, and also you know, deliver the bandwidth necessary for the different IPs in a much more efficient pattern. So that's that's basically what uh, Infinity Fabric is. And you'll be able to get it at the Gap. <laughs> the Gap will be selling it. Maybe Banana Republic. <laughs> I have a question that kind of plays off kind of the themes we've been going on here, because everything we've talked about is basically improving efficiency, right? And that, it seems like with the technological preview you guys did for Vega, that seems to be one of the driving forces behind it, mm -hmm. you know, because you guys have the programmable geometry pipeline that basically you guys said, for example, in uh, Deus Ex, there's 220 million polygons, mm -hmm. but you only see two million of them. Yeah. And it throws away all the ones you don't see, basically, right? right? right. And you guys also have the drawstring bending rasterizer that kind of does the same thing for pixels you don't see, right? Yes, yes. Is there any way to quantify how much performance difference there is using those versus what we have going on right now? Right, so, I mean, it's a case-by-case case thing, right? Uh -huh. So, so you know, some extreme examples are, mm -hmm. are particular frames in a game, mm -hmm. right? The, the benefit could be quite large, yep. <laughs> right? So, and then some particular frames of the game um, could be very efficient already uh, mm -hmm. from our existing efficiency techniques, right? So if you look at it, the, you know, um, in some ways, right, it is basically our technologies to not draw things that user doesn't see, right? You know, keeps improving. And if you look at even the VR space, there's a lot of work and talk going on about foveated rendering and all. It's more of, I hey, didn't you, that. It makes yeah, sense. right in there. So yeah. I think what you'll see us do, you know, Vega is a, is a big step with the new architecture, but you know, you'll see kind of this steady stream of like pixels that don't matter. Uh, you know, how do we kind of, you know, reduce the cost of that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the reason is simple, right? Because, like, you know, Gordon and me were talking about this stuff in there that the cost of, like, gaming, actually, if you look at it, right, it's like, you know, you want to do 4K gaming, it's very, very expensive. So how do we bring mm -hmm. that down so we have to be much more efficient mm -hmm. uh, with, with, with what we do with transistors and to, 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 to bring it down to the consumer? So that's the goal, right? It's, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes people think that, 
we're doing all of this to make something run faster or get higher benchmarks. Mm -hmm. But I, I look at it differently. That's be, that is like, how can we bring like you know the great experience to lower price points because more users can can enjoy. So that's that, that was your idea um, with Polaris and RX four eighty, right? The same idea, making it more efficient, bringing it down to the two hundred dollar price point. Right, right. It's yeah. a, you know th then it's kind of connecting to what user experience are we trying to enable this year. Yep. Right, and you know, then it's combination of performance, power envelopes, price, mm -hmm. right? All of them kind of needs to need to look, look at uh, together. And and by the way, that's one thing. I mean, I know we are on a PC gaming show. Mm -hmm. I mean, I look at it and say that you know there is a lot of PC gaming can learn from game consoles, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, know, you see, uh, <laughs> in, in terms of the, the you're going to have to have a good example to win him over. Yeah, no, no, in terms <laughs> of. Uh, delivered performance per the cost factor, right in there, right in, in the thing in there, right. So, you know, the the, the, the PC gaming stuff is a little more, you know, uh, variable. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right in there. So, I, and since our experience on the console and all, you know, we, we look at it. Uh, we have an overall system view, much better system view. Mm -hmm. We definitely would like, you know, I'm super passionate about PC gaming, and mm -hmm. you know, AMD is super passionate about PC. Uh, mm -hmm. So we'd like to kind of bring, you know, some different perspective for, uh, for well, PC gaming. Well, it seems smart, right? Because like uh, your console experience was kind of help what inspired you guys to make uh, Mantle, right? Is that, yes. is that correct? Yes. So that yes. kind of pushed DX12. So yes. consoles are already changing PC gaming in a big way. Yeah, yeah. Basically. True. Actually, that's a good segue <laughs> to DX12. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, some of the DX12 titles have been a little underwhelming. Mm -hmm. Do you think 2017 is going to be the big breakout for DX12? And uh, for the AMD fans who always want to say, why is AMD, why does why is AMD doing so well on DX12 when mm -hmm. compared to Nvidia? Yeah, on DX11. So, yeah, um, uh, absolutely. First, uh, you know, I don't want to kind of quote numbers uh, that I don't exactly remember. <laughs> we have uh, I have the data. Uh, I, I, sure. You know, I can share with you. So. There is definitely kind of a you know hockey stick stuff happening in 2017 with the number of DX12 titles, right? You know, the engines and titles they take they are like you know one in one two year development cycles, right? So they've been working on it for a long time. So uh, there's definitely a swell of DX12 titles and also Vulcan titles. Right? You know, Vulcan is also picking up. Uh, so you'll see that in uh, 2017. The second part of the question: Why is AMD? Why does AMD do so well uh, in DX12 titles? You know the. The reasons are kind of you know multitude, uh, but probably the most important ones are uh, that the optimization point for most of lot of the titles is around the game consoles, right? mm -hmm. uh, and it makes DX12 and Vulcan make it much much more easier for them to do bring whatever they're doing on the console directly over to the PC, mm -hmm. right? It makes sense. Uh, and so on the console, they utilize every little bit of the engine that they got, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they, because if you look at the specs of the console, sure. much lower than, you know, a medium PC, yeah. But, yeah. but it actually kind of, you know, net, net, net performs uh, better than uh, like a, you know, mid-range PC. So, for to do that on a PC, we needed a lower head API, and also that exposed, more that's lower head API is one thing, the second one is uh, exposing all the features that the GPU has, mm -hmm. right? Like asynchronous compute and, you mm -hmm. know, the uh, inlining of uh, assembly uh, in, in uh, inside the shaders, right. uh, all of those features uh, help them. Yeah. And uh, from a console developer perspective, if you think of their optimization they do on a console, or actually a game developer perspective, it is their IP, mm -hmm. it is their intellectual property. And if you can utilize your intellectual property on more platforms, good for you. And before... Especially them costing so much to make these days. Exactly, yeah. before they weren't able to, like PC development is this, and, and for a lot of them PC development was an afterthought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. right. So, in the DX11 days, what we did was basically all of this inefficient code that we get from uh, the game developer, uh, we were trying to optimize this inside the drivers, mm -hmm. right? And um, and we do on some titles. We still continue to do that uh, in there, but it becomes a scale problem. How many titles can I, uh, you know, uh, do, keep optimizing behind the back? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, then it becomes basically kind of an arms race of who, which company has 
more engineers just to optimize inside the drivers, behind the game's back, you know, replace all their shaders and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and the driver becomes like huge, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the DX11 drivers, the old drivers, are, you know, they are Massive. bigger than operating <laughs> system. Yep. You know, graphics driver <laughs> stack is bigger than the operating system because they are all, you can think of the old graphics drivers as they are multiple game engines encoded inside the driver. <laughs> Right, so it's not you know scalable, sustainable thing. Now the X12 driver is thin, nothing <laughs> in there, and that's why actually in in some ways it's a challenge for us because the game developer, it's the whole burden is on the game developer now. So that's why we have you know we increased resources on our game engineering side that we worked with ISV. Then you know because the X12, there's the state comes from the the game and goes directly to the hardware. There's nobody touching it. <laughs> yeah, the, so in DirectX 11 it was on you and your drivers, and DirectX 12 is on the game developers. Yes, yes. 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 Right. Oh. All this Vulcan talk actually segues into a Vega question that I have. Mm -hmm. So the only demo you've let people play so far is Doom running at 4K Ultra, right? Mm -hmm. And we're, you know, I played it, played it, it runs awesome, it's great, great game, looking smooth. And it runs, you know, it can hit up to 85 frames per second, but typically when you're running, it's running 60 to 70 frames per second. At 4K Ultra, everything cranked. Uh, which beats the pants off of uh, the GTX 1080. Uh, but that's running Vulcan. Would it still beat the pants off the GTX 1080 if it was running in DirectX 11? Um, <laughs> Doom doesn't have a DX11 path. Right? Uh, yeah, OpenGL. Open 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 you, yeah, you got me, you got me. You meant uh, <laughs> the OpenGL path. Yes. Uh, I, think, I, I think it would because, you know, <laughs> at that resolution, uh -huh. uh, things are uh, more... Um, uh, GPU bound, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, less CPU bound. Mm -hmm. That's one factor. But I, I let, <laughs> let me not say that too, over, too confidently because the uh, the Doom developer had done mm -hmm. uh, some, you know, the console optimizations like, you know, the mm -hmm. inline assembly shaders the and all. Intrinsic shaders, yeah. The, right, right. Intrinsic shader, shader intrinsics they did bring in. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think they are available through OpenGL. I mean, so, mm -hmm. and that's not a fundamental OpenGL issue. Yeah. It's just that we didn't invest into putting all the extensions back into OpenGL, which mm -hmm. we could have. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I only have finite number of engineers, so they're yep, just focused sure. on what will come in there. I have one more question related to that, unless you had something playing was, off of it. Uh, well, no, no. Like, I, I had a, a, a different question related okay. to physical stuff. So. so you said that was running Vega 10, right? Yeah. Is that the high-end Vega 10 or the entry-level Vega 10? Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, Vega 10 is a code name, right? Internal okay. code name. Did we actually say Vega 10? You just said Vega 10 and I acknowledge as <laughs> truth. I don't know. I don't know what you Vega said. Vega 10, 10 is. in California. <laughs> <laughs> that was public, yeah, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, again, you know, in terms of, you know, speeds, feeds, bins and all. Not talking about we, it. We, 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 yeah, we have a lot of work to do to figure okay. all of those things out. So my question as a, an enthusiast, um, we know that, you know, NVIDIA said we give up on multi-car beyond SLI. If you want to do more than that, that's fine. Mm -hmm. And you guys, I think, have said we're still going to do multi-car, so three-way, four-way. Mm -hmm. Is that in, not saying specifically for Vega or future? Just is that something you still think there's room for in the future? Yeah, you know, I, we definitely think there is room for in the future, and um, you know, with the new APIs, DX12 and uh, Vulkan, right? They made uh, multi-GPU accessible directly to the game developer, right? So the algorithm to parallelize. Uh, and distribute work among more than two GPUs uh, is definitely a, uh, an active uh, collaboration we are having with uh, various game, game companies and all. But it will take time, it will okay. take time, right? So uh, I, I still uh, think that, um, you know, the multi-GPU stuff, you know, we should offer that, you know, why mm -hmm. not, right? You know, if, uh, you know, you saw some 8K displays uh, mm -hmm. popping up on the show floor and, uh, yep. and all, right? So right. I, I think, you know, the PC gaming, that, that's the great thing about PC gaming, right? You know, they are, uh, I mean, there, there is enough interesting people that will buy kind of, you know, the latest, greatest kind of, you know, 8K display and want to drive all these pixels. Mm -hmm. You know, give them option, you know, if, right. if they, they can buy, you know, two or three cards in there and put there, you know, give it up. That's, that's been the greatness of the PC platform is, is mm -hmm. that flexibility. I agree yes. the PC is great. <laughs> uh, Tyler, question from the audience? Yeah, just a general question about the interaction between Vega and FreeSync and how that kind of uh, operates within the architecture. Okay, so the I, question is, how does how will Vega work with FreeSync? I actually have a kind of question that ties into that, uh, which tags into FreeSync too. So maybe I should do it after you answer that one. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, we, but by the way, FreeSync uh, is you know based on kind of industry standard uh, VESA spec and all, right? So we got you know the display engine uh, supports everything on you know past FreeSync and some advancements on uh, on on Vega definitely. Um, and definitely supports FreeSync 2 and all of that stuff. So it's only kind of, you know, just moves forward. So, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. So my question about FreeSync 2, which you guys announced just the other day. Uh, that's one of the, to me, the most exciting trends here at CES, is all of a sudden all these HDR monitors are popping up. I've been waiting for this forever. Uh, but the thing is, the implementations are kind of all over the place. Uh, different monitors support HDR10. Different ones support Dolby Vision. Mm -hmm. uh, G-Sync just launched, uh, NVIDIA just launched G-Sync HDR monitors. FreeSync 2, I know, ties a lot into HDR. Is there any secret sauce that you guys have that improves the HDR experience with FreeSync 2? So, uh, it, you know, the HDR capability, you know, the, 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 the bigger dynamic range capability, as you all know, has existed in many panels for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, making it uh, seamless, right, from the interface standpoint of view and from the software standpoint of view has been the challenge. Mm -hmm. And with FreeSync too, it's, you know, FreeSync actually, everything about FreeSync, there is no secret sauce. Mm -hmm. That was uh, our entire goal, mm -hmm. is not to have secret sauce so that we can have the panel vendors, the controller vendors, mm -hmm. the software ecosystem, everybody just drive it with an open uh, approach, right? Mm -hmm. So the enabling the HDR, what we did was actually, we looked at basically, what are all the, the, the panel capabilities that already exist, mm -hmm. okay? What are the GPU capabilities that already exist? How do we make that when the panel has these capabilities, that it is easily detected by the operating system, you know, in a convenient way that, oh, this is capable of HDR, it has this dynamic range, it has this depth and all, mm -hmm. and communicate that information to the ISV mm -hmm. in a robust fashion. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also kind of you know, reward panels that actually have good HDR implementations because mm -hmm. they can now say, you know, easy to brand and say, oh, we have FreeSync 2 support. FreeSync 2 means that we, also, we, we have the whole refresh rate, uh, mm -hmm. uh, variable refresh rate technology, but also it, they're capable of supporting HDR. Mm -hmm. So FreeSync 2, I mean, some of the high level, level benefits for gamers is, uh, the idea is it reduce lag, right? Because it yeah. just does a single pass of game tone mapping. It'll make it so that when you start playing the game, it'll automatically kick your monitor brightness up to, and all that stuff up to optimize HDR and go exactly. back to normal when you're on the desktop. Yeah. Uh, but it requires game developers to use an API, right? Um, uh, it requires game developers for, again, it depends, right? Okay. It depends on um, what, uh, what pa parameters they want to exactly control, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, if they, uh, at the end of the day, game developers do have to take responsibility for HDR, mm -hmm. right? There is no auto HDR that we can do. Mm -hmm. The original content was uh, not, not HDR, right? Mm -hmm. You'll see some benefit for you know certain certain cases and all, but the source content needs to be HDR. So if a game uh, supports HDR, but they, for whatever reason, haven't implemented the FreeSync 2 API, Will you still see some of those benefits from FreeSync 2, such as the reduced latency, yes, you'll auto brightness, see, stuff like that? Yes, you'll see, you'll see, you'll see benefits in some cases. Uh, okay. On, on, on what, what I want to know, if, like for as a consumer going out and they're buying a panel, <clears throat> there's a lot more FreeSync monitors out there. G-Sync is great and all, but it costs, there's a premium to it. Mm -hmm. Do you guys see this only ending one way? I mean, don't number, is, is the only thing that matters with monitors is just the sheer number of monitors that support your standard versus their standard? No, I, I you know, I, I don't think um, uh, that's the way we should look at it. Uh, but what was uh, uh, really kind of interesting and uh, in, in some way, you know, positive, uh, we were happy about it, but kind of I, uh, unexpected was the amount of support we got for FreeSync, right? It's just mind blowing, right? It is disproportional to kind of our market share. Right, mm -hmm. right, uh, and the reason for that is because, as we, as I said, it's a very useful feature, mm -hmm. okay, and it was anybody else can work with it, right? You know, we, it wasn't proprietarily tried to, you know, uh, uh, the AMD ecosystem, right? And that's why the panel uh, vendors just loved it, and also the cost of implementing FreeSync for them is also much, much lower than other. Um, uh, you know approaches that uh, that uh, you know that are out there, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think that's you know, and, and it's just been quite amazing, given the kind of the top panels, right? Just like you know, putting FreeSync, and you know, we named it just you know off the cuff <laughs> at CES two year, 
Yeah, yeah, in uh, 2014, actually, right? Mm -hmm. It's basically three years ago, CES, just at CES, at the show, I, you know, just said informally to a journalist that, hey, we have free sync, you know, <laughs> you know they have, and, and it kind of became, you know, now three years after, <laughs> so many panels, so many monitors and all, and I see the logo on the, on the panel boxes makes, makes us uh, very, very proud. I, I, what I'm wondering is, if it's, and I mentioned this, we had Tom Peterson on the show, we talked about it, and it sounds like they're a little, you know, they're still not going to do free sync, but for NVIDIA, they're still mass, the larger, they're the largest part of the, the gamers, or 75% of gamers are running NVIDIA, something like that. But I bet a lot of those gamers are actually running NVIDIA video cards with FreeSync panels because it's just, it's free, it's cheaper. I'm wondering, do you think when those gamers go out to upgrade in a cycle or so, and they go like, hey, I've got a FreeSync panel, Maybe I should get an AMD card, or I mean, I, I, you know, I, that's what I would do. Uh, you know, uh, Vega is coming, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, Polaris is already here. For you know, RX 480 is great if uh, you know, depending on your budget, and if you uh, want, to spend, a, want our... to spend a bit more, mm -hmm. you have Vega coming, and you know, your FreeSync uh, panel investment will pay off uh, even more. So, right? you, so last question on that topic for me, but do you think at some point they will support FreeSync just I, to stop the momentum? You, <laughs> yeah, you want to right. get into Couple. politics? No, no. <laughs> and, uh, oh. <laughs> so FreeSync 2, on the other hand, it takes like, uh, FreeSync's nice, everybody can use it, no problem, but FreeSync 2 requires, you know, they're going to be in HDR monitors, which are naturally going to be more expensive. Uh, and they also require more certification, right? Uh, so you guys were saying you expect it to be a very small portion of FreeSync. FreeSync and FreeSync 2 are both going to be there. You expect there to be vastly more FreeSync monitors than FreeSync 2 monitors. Do you have any idea, do you have a ballpark figure where you guys would like to be with FreeSync 2 monitor adoption oh, with, this year? With, with um, FreeSync 2 monitors, yeah, you know, it's basically, um, it's going to, you know, start with uh, a few key, uh, you know, announcement, hopefully that'll mm -hmm. go down, you know, go in Q1 or something. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have an exact figure of what, you know, by, by the Christmas time, what percentage will be freezing to and all. Okay. Uh, but I think, you know, it will definitely help the, the, our, our panel manufacturers that, you know, that freezing to uh, get kind of, you know, some marketing value for them, right? Then it makes it easy for them to kind of can upgrade their entire lineup by the time we get to next, uh, next CES to have freezing to and all. But also content coming, right? HDR. I mean, uh, HDR is, uh, you have seen the demo, so it's just, you know, Mind brilliant. <laughs> right, right. But uh, we have to drive the entire ecosystem to get there, right? And, and you know, this is, you know, and that's another great thing about PC market. It's not like about, hey, if 100 million guys don't get this, we won't do it, or 10 million. It's like, you know, even if it was benefit for first 10,000 people, we do, and then the 10,000 becomes 100,000, 100,000 becomes a million, <laughs> right? And, uh, and and that's the great thing about PC ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we are not littered by, hey, it is starting small percentage. Because everything mm -hmm. on PC starts with small percentage, right? We are started with like, you know, a few hundreds of headsets in dev kits, and mm -hmm. now, you know, people are talking numbers in millions. <laughs> it's all <laughs> over right? the place here at VS. It's 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 exactly, right? And, you know, which, which other ecosystem can talk about that, right? It's, you know, like, the, the, you yeah. know, that kind of stuff in there, right? Mm -hmm. The entire technology industry engine is run by PC. Right. 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 Yeah. You heard of here, PC better than everyone else. <laughs> heard of here in PC world, who would have thought? <laughs> can you say, what can I ask? I'm trying to think of how can I ask a question without it being um, too political, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. Could yeah, you guys said it. where it's going to be, uh, <laughs> Where Vega is going to be made is who's the, who's the fab? Have you guys said who the fab is for? Uh, for uh, Vega. For Vega. Um, uh, I don't think we have said it okay. publicly. Uh, okay. Then you can't say no. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I can. Uh, so since you're talking about PC, there's one thing I want to, uh, you know, tell you guys. I haven't told you before, but you know, to the audience too, right in there that, you know, I think. We got to think of you know the, the the PC differently moving forward, right? I you know actually you know the PC the P stands for personal computing, right? Mm -hmm. and actually, I think the P in personal computing actually should be performance, right? It's basically you know, that's what differentiates you know PC from 
Right. Now everything is a computer these days, right? You know, you have, you're carrying a computer in your pocket and, and all this yes. stuff. But PC, you know, to me, the differentiated is, is performance, right? Yes. You know, between uh, all these other devices. So sometimes I look at some of the directions of PC where they have, you know, not so great performance devices that people cobble up into systems and all. Mm -hmm. I see that as pointless, right? It's like, mm -hmm. it's performant or not. Right. <laughs> that's it, right? You know, that's the only thing that matters, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the end. Uh, At this point, if you're, if you have a desktop, you are an enthusiast, is, in my opinion. Because yes. <laughs> yes. Otherwise, you have a laptop, I guess. Or, yeah. you know, <laughs> or, or, or some constrained device, right? And yeah. then, right? Some performance constrained device. So the DIY, you guys, the DIY audience, the, the enthusiasts, they're still very much important to AMD then right now. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, the amount of, uh, um, you know, the, uh, the pull we are seeing from them for Ryzen, and, you know, you've seen all the kind of motherboards and all, it's just kind of amazing. It's, it's, it's like, you know, the people walk in here and, uh, you know, some of the community and enthusiasts, and they're like, oh, we come in here and you guys actually like PC. You know, we go to other, supposedly big PC companies, they don't seem to like PC at all. <laughs> you know? And we're unfortunately giving all our money to companies that don't like PC. <laughs> right? So, uh, so uh, anyway, you know, we love, we love the PC. <laughs> awesome. I'm going to wrap it up, or do you guys Anybody buy down a question? Does any, nobody wants a question, right. that's fine. You Crazy. You your chance, we are going to wrap it up here. Important man, he has important things to do. Anyway, thanks for joining us on The Full Nerd with Brad. Adios. And our very special guest, Roger. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, man. Thank you.